giving the manual and you would just hack around <laughs> and jump in there. Throw myself in, yeah. So again, if you make a game, a serious game, you may accommodate both types of users. Some would like to know what they're doing and afraid they're doing something that may ruin the game and, and some will just, hey, let's go for it. I don't care about reading anything, I just go for it. So these are different styles and, and, uh, and you will see them, obviously. Anybody else do the hand mouse one? You should do it, and then we can talk about it next time and see. Uh, we'll talk about it plot, plot where we are. Yes, we'll have, we'll, we'll have a cl class because plot. What you, what you can do is, oops, I needed, I needed to make a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you have, uh, uh, let's see, concrete experience, uh, or you have the conceptual, you have active, you have reflection. So what you what you will end up may end up doing is uh, you can you could plot where you are, how far out here you are. So as as I said, I'm I'm quite out here and I'm medium here. So you can kind of draw your your diagram of that, and then active and not so much here. Something like that is Simon's drawing. So you can make a drawing that characterizes and and what you might want to think of is whether you would like to stretch out in any direction where you aren't as strong. This is the definition of uh, or <coughs> characteristics and what activities they may prefer. Uh, and, and you, you have read the paper and, and you can look into that. What's important here is to understand that these different groups have different triggers to make them engaged and, and motivated to, to be involved. Now, if you put those two models, uh, this model on top of the cult model, so cold had the concrete experience, abstract conceptualization, active, reflective, and the accommodated diverger, a simulated converger. The, the terms being used by Hannah Mumford would be the activist, which I think is much better. Activist is one who is active to get more concrete experiences. You have the reflector that takes the, these, uh, these experiences and reflect on them, trying to, to make a kind of a, uh, understand why. And then you have the theorist that is trying to take all these reflections, <coughs> put them into one conceptual model. And then the paragraphist is the one who takes that model and is trying to actively experiment to see if it holds, to validate and to see where the, where the breaks are so that you can go on in a new circle. Again, if you didn't do the test, I think you, you should. Um, now, discussion point. Where would educational games fit in this picture? Simon was saying that this corner, obviously, you are active, and you 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 have an active, or or your base for knowledge and, and is a concrete experience, and you like to experiment actively. So games would fit here. What else? Could you, could you think of? Private mm -hmm. test, yeah, because you are actively experimenting. You have some models, and you can actively see simulations and play with parameters in simulation to see if it holds. What about reflection and theories? I think, I think we have a good example of a, of a game that is challenging this. Because you could, I'm, yeah, I'm the, the... Dragon Box. Yeah. If you have seen Dragon Box, it teaches you, or kids, Algebra, by trying to create mental models, conceptual models, by, by seeing patterns that are not linked to X's and Y's and numbers, but seeing patterns in, in structure. So that would, to me, in, that would be kind of helping a reflective structure. To me, it's less challenging more of, it's not just playing with numbers and being active, it's also about building a conceptual understanding that the kids would have that you make easy for them to do that. Have you looked at Dragon Box? You should. Dragon Box is uh, it's Norwegian? Yeah, well, a French yeah. guy who moved to Norway. Whatever. Um, we like to say it's Norwegian. Yeah, it's, in Norway. it, 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 it's a hiring Norwegian. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the, the idea is that they, they're trying to, to teach algebra, but you start by not seeing numbers, they're trying to match up symbols or icons or, or, or uh, animals and, and trying to understand that you need to balance, you can move from one to the other if you inverse. And I mean, 
the basic algebra operations by not seeing any excess or numbers that would scare kids by, by just looking at the uh, at, uh, monsters. Monsters. Yeah, monsters. <laughs> So, so I mean, I mean to, uh, so my my main message is that this is obvious. If we want to make good series games, maybe we should challenge ourselves and look how to make games that will help students reflect on their uh, on their experience and to to just to be, build some conceptual models that would help them to understand the more active side as well. And I, I think things like chess would probably fit in the assimilator. Right? Because you don't really... You, know, you can learn chess, sort of, by just playing lots of chess games. But that's a get, start. That's a start. But, but you, get you don't get really expert good game. at chess by just playing a lot of chess. You get good at chess by thinking that an abstract... Well, I mean, even Go would be perhaps even more abstract than chess because chess has, like, some tangible... I've, I've got a little peasant and I've got a a knight, and I've got the queen and the king. I've got things I can attach to it. Go is you've got white and black stones. Who's played Go? Who's never heard of Go? Okay. You have a game today. <laughs> that, that's a challenge. But yeah, so, so Go is a very abstract game, and you only get good by doing, by being a theorist. Um, and they say you can't become a, like the, the top-level Japanese players. You have to start by the age of five. Or else you won't be able to learn to play Go perfect, like at a at the top level. So yeah, it's and, really crazy theoretical. And, and we'll not talk about the Squire paper. And I think Squire is actually pushing over here. It's very much about reflecting and making a theory, making assumption or or, or testing a little bit of, of, of testing here, which, but but to a large degree over here, which is which I think is uh, that uh, it, it's quite obvious that when you want to. To train, I mean, uh, games for health. It's, it's very much here. You need to, to train, be physically active one way or the other. But for for education, it is something to think about if you want to fill this gap rather than, than just uh, the active part, which is so obvious anyway. Now, the uh, BART model is very different because this one goes more into how you learn, and, and this is more into the how. Uh, knowledge is communicated, or how information is communicated, how you grasp what you what you hear and see. And Bark is then for visual. Do you prefer seeing models, seeing visual representation, figures, drawings, uh, photos that explain the phenomenon, or do you like to hear about it? I mean, uh, professors tend to think that everybody are oral, so we can keep on talking for forty five minutes, and that's good. And, and we know that every, at the best, every 10 minutes, you all drop out. At the best, every 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> what? When I, when I saw probably for, for more frequently. Um, or are you the one who doesn't care about lecture? You will like a textbook and sit down and read and write and understand by reading and writing? Or the hands-on guy who will like to do experiments, set up uh, systems and test and play actively. So what is uh, so where I would think that you guys, since you are masters, aren't very very low on this. You're a little bit high on this, and maybe visual. Is that right, or where did you end up? I don't oral and kinesthetic. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, visual and read write what it seems so like those were. Right. Oh, so you're you're a K a, a, a K -A. Yeah. I suppose. Yes. <laughs> My K is almost not there. <laughs> okay. And all that? about the K? <laughs> yeah. You're all about the K. You're completely K. Yep. Brad? Brad? I am kinesthetic and reflector and visual and visual health. You have a challenge in your life. <laughs> so you're kinesthetic, you you like being you like Doing things that you spend a lot of time reflecting on. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other other people. Weird. I mean, models. Models can be uh, be played with. I think. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, when, when yes, you can. You can uh, theoretically. You could. I mean. Uh, okay. I had a, a, a discussion. We were going to do a visual media PhD. Do you know what guys know what visual media is? Would you guess what visual media is? 
Can you guess what visual media might be? Television. Right. Everything, so, everything but radio. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. One guy was saying that, you know, he wanted to study radio as part of the visual media PhD because it created pictures in your head. <laughs> And at that point, I went, no, that's not <laughs> no, 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 you can't have a definition that includes everything that exists as being inside the class. Well, because then your word means nothing. Well, if you look at the uh, uh, definition uh, of e-learning, you find that it is... Uh, <laughs> e-learning doesn't everything. actually mean anything because no, it means it's everything. everything right? um, <laughs> and so when, when, when you use a word or when you have a learning style or a model, also thinking about the things it excludes... Are, is very important. Uh, it's one of the problems we have as academics. Particularly, we want you to learn things, right? And so we look at a course and go, oh, we missed that thing, we'll add it in. Oh, we, we need more of that, so we add it in. We need more of that, we add it in. But we don't usually do the, oh, what do we have to take out before we add that extra stuff in? Because we just want you guys to learn more and more and more and more, and we just push more and more into the course without being selective and say, what explicitly are we not going to teach you in this course? So there's space to teach you what we want to teach you, right? And that's also when you're designing a game, it might be very useful not just to think, how do we cram more experiences in? How do we get more people? How do we get more oral people and more reading and writing and more kinesthetic and more visual and try and make everything for everyone and say, no, no, no. What are you explicitly not doing, right? Can you exclude some things from your actions? Right. So. It's like girls shopping clothes. Yeah, Trying to pick everything. You want to buy, <laughs> buy it all, <laughs> but you know you, you don't take anything out. No, no if you keep, keep like oh, I'll need this and I'll need this. Your pack gets too big, and then it... <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's uh, I think that's one message is that trying to to make all games strong on everything is uh, is not necessarily a good strategy. But I, I think that we would think that games, education games, pictures will be on the initial kinesthetic side. <laughs> But while I'm not, I mean, lots of kids have problems reading. Okay, so games have helped students to read. Did any of you guys play um, the the dungeon, um, like um, uh, the the dungeon creeper games, um, the the the, very, the early text based muds, multi user dimensions, or multi user dungeon stuff? No. Okay, I, the 93, were you guys alive? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in, in, in 94, 95, um, I played a lot of text-based um, adventure games. Okay? Um, in fact, we got in trouble with the university for using up all the bandwidth. Yeah. <laughs> and that was text. Yes, it was text, and we used up uh, uh, the university. That says um, something about the bandwidth. That was <laughs> and the reason why it was text was that graphics just wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't cut it. It was 94, you couldn't do the graphics. And so yeah, we're, we're playing with people all over the world. But that was very rewrite, really, really heavy rewrite. Um, but you don't have so much of that anymore. We've kind of lost that as a game style. Um, but I think so. Being strong on this axis mm -hmm. means that your thesis is going to be a written thing. So, so yeah, working on read write might be something to, <laughs> to to challenge yourself. Was anybody in R a read write? Okay, you guys are lucky. <laughs> you're lucky for that purpose. You're right. I'm not just I'm just sure if that's what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 that is, uh, uh, both these instruments and all those measuring instruments you find, you can always question whether it's accurate and you can always interpret the questions and one day are in the mood for interpreting one way and the next day in a different way. But that's why you can feel that some of the questions are asking the same thing. Yes, they are, because they are thinking that if you keep on answering the same way, then, or if you aren't sure, it's going to be a more mixed message. So, yeah, no... Uh, Psychological measurement so I mean, instruments aren't that great. So. Yeah. I basically, you have to t define, I, I, I kind of use the continuum between astrology and height. Okay? I got really clean objective measures of your height, right? I can, I can ask someone else to measure your height, and they'll come back with pretty much the same measures that I have when I measure your height. Astrology? Yeah, no, it's whatever the person felt like at the time. So, um, <coughs> yeah. So, so some of the... Meta level discussion in the world, the paper, as you can see, I skipped all of the 
his style, the LD's author style, and uh, style B of the, the bark. I think that it's more interesting for you to be aware of the, the differences, both as potential developers, but also as a learner yourself. Uh, but there are some uh, learning style issues, and one will be that how do you assess? And, and you see in the, uh, the bark questionnaire a different type of variance of that as well. And uh, the learning style questionnaire is the one I put out. There is also learning style inventory that goes for cult models and some other instruments that um, uh, there, uh, Simon talked about the Bartle style for gaming styles last week and there are, you, you'll find lots of these instruments around and you can try them and being aware. And what I think that from an education point of view, I would like to see is look at it from the student perspective and then from the uh, lecturer perspective. From the student's perspective, I think it's a little bit about the self-efficacy. I mean, you would like to have control of your learning and knowing your strengths and weaknesses so that you can challenge your, your weaknesses and, and try to be a more complete learner might be a, a good strategy. And it is possible, even though you don't find reading that exciting or you don't like doing all these experiments because they're just confusing and you can't control them, it is possible to try to work on your own motivation. To, to actually find interest in you, if that's not what you naturally like. It is possible to push yourself to do that. So I think for the student, I think this is good that you know your style, your preferences, so that you can challenge and, and you can be, uh, work with your lack of motivation in certain areas. But from the teacher perspective, I think the, the goal is not to try to understand what your style is and say, okay, I have to give you something to read, I have to give you something that you could play on, I have to give you something you could listen to, I have to give you something that you could look at. No, I don't think that's good. I, I think what we need to make sure is that we aren't using just one channel or we aren't just focusing on one of the four phases in learning because that means that some would find it very easy, maybe so easy it's not motivating because you're also the flow, flow zone and others would find it just that they really didn't use it always. So, so I think from a teacher perspective and then the same as from a game perspective, you need to think about who would you be addressing, who would you be targeting, what would be the group, and what would be their, their <coughs> styles and their uh, their preferences and what, so that you aren't blocking some of your target group from using whatever you design. Um, looking at the paper, um, I, I was quite happy about the what the uh, their conclusions when it comes to their study. I think they they lack some uh, some uh, evidence, empirical evidence for some of their conclusions. Um, I have a question about consistency. Uh, would preferred learning style be stable over time? Would you always, in all situations, in the all across context? Would you want to learn chemistry the way you learn math? I mean, it may not be that the, uh, the style is totally independent of context, and it may not be that over time it, it is constant. So, um, and then the question, how do you want to make use of it? Do students learn more if it's taught in their preferred style? Then the question is, what do you want them to learn? Do you want them to learn math, or do you want them to learn to learn new stuff when they need to learn. I mean, there, there are levels to learning. Uh, and if they do learn better, if it's just, is it just short-sighted to adapt it optimally for each style or for each student? Or do you want to actually challenge students? I think that what these systems should do should also be to challenge students on the weaker sides. So what do you guys think? Did you read the paper differently? You were more interested in the actual results from their study, or 